today, our Christmas message is going to be from Matthew 2. We're going to read Matthew 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. If you have your Bible, you can follow along, otherwise you can listen. And this is the story of the Magi and how the Magi come from the far east to visit Jesus and his family. So Matthew 2, and we'll begin at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. As far the reading of Scripture. So brothers and sisters and all of our visitors who may be tuning in via the live stream, today of course is Christmas, the day when we celebrate the birth of Jesus our Lord. We celebrate the feast of our Savior, at least here in Canada and in the Western world. We typically celebrate the feast of our Savior by feasting together, giving each other gifts, singing Christmas carols, and uh, often uh, some of us even drink eggnog. Remarkably, And often we are so consumed with the joy of the season that we find a church service actually somewhat odd in many ways. I mean, amid all the Christmas lights and the Christmas trees and the shopping for presents, uh, why stop and hold the Christmas service? What's this about? I mean, even my own kids are practically vibrating as they haven't opened their presents yet. And the rest of us, we we tend to wonder, like our kids, why would we go to church? But the story of the Magi in Matthew 2, it, it reorients our view as to what Christmas is really about and why we might hold a Christmas service. The Magi are these wise men from the east, from perhaps from Iran or, or from Arabia or Iraq. And these men, they see a, a remarkable star and they decide to follow it all of the way to Jerusalem in the west. They believe this star heralds the birth of a great king. And they enter Jerusalem and they utter the famous words that we should reflect on deeply today. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to what? Worship him. These men travel for days, weeks, following a star to worship a child. And I think today as we sit here in church or as we're watching on the live stream, this ought to tip us off as to why on earth we're in a church today. Because if these men did that 2,000 years ago, perhaps it's not so unusual what we're doing here. If this king is great enough to be worthy of his own special star, 
that ought to make us think. It's a stunning fact, and not only does this king have a star, but strange men, powerful and rich men from far away, worship. And that's what they want. And you might ask, well, what does it mean that they came to worship? What is worshiping someone? What is that? Well, the word for worship here in the passage here basically means in literal terms, kissing someone's feet. And the point being that when you worship someone in the ancient Near East, you bow down or you laid yourself prostrate on the ground and you kiss the feet of the one whom you would worship, your king or your ruler. That's literally what worship is. And that doesn't mean that's always what people did, but when people in the Mid Middle East thought about worship, that's the image that came to their mind. And so the Magi come to do that. And it's interesting that the Bible often speaks of worship in other places. Worship is a theme throughout the scriptures, in fact. In fact, Psalm 2, written a thousand years before what we read here in Matthew, it says, Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. And then in verse 12, kiss his son or he will be angry. And by that, the poetry is meant to say, kiss the feet of the Son of God. And so the, the Magi are, in a sense, predicted here. Or even in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible, we have a description of the throne room of God. God is sitting on his throne in heaven. He's surrounded by angels and cre different creatures. And then it talks about the angels and what they're doing. What are they doing and all the elders? The angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And what do they do? They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. They fall down and they worship. Worship. We fall down on our face and kiss the feet of the one to whom we're dependent upon, the Lord or the King whom we're subject to. You might say, well, that's not what Christmas is about, is it? But again, if the Magi are willing to come and do that for the baby Jesus, that ought to make us think. And you might ask the question, the question you should be asking, why would the Magi bow down and worship a baby? Or he, Jesus may have been a small child at this time. But if you're willing to ask that question, I would respond with another question. If, again, if the Magi, learned and powerful as they are, are willing to kiss the feet of this child, then perhaps it's not so unusual or irrational for us to do the same today. And this is the point that's coming through in this passage. You see, the story of the Magi is not a story of exotic Eastern magicians or uh, merely a myth designed to entertain our years. The story of the Magi comes home with deadly significance, cosmic significance for your life. The story of the Magi has the truth, has a truth in it that can transform you. And so think about the story you can walk through the story to make more sense of this. What's the, what are the Magi doing? Well, first of all, they see this special star. Now, people have tried for, there are there's countless articles and literature and, and, and such on what this star might have been. There's all sorts of guesswork. Unfortunately, nobody really knows. The best proof is actually that Chinese astronomy tables do record a particularly bright star in the West in 5 BC. Maybe that's proof, maybe it's not. Maybe the star was the confluence of planets that we actually just don't know. But these magicians, somehow they, they know from some sort of source, maybe an ancient Jewish source, they know that a particularly bright star is going to be proof that a king, a special king, is going to be born in Jerusalem. 
They saddle their camels, they pack their goods, and they travel all the way to Jerusalem. It's a most unusual thing. And they come to Jerusalem and they ask the current king of Judea, King Herod, this famous question, where is the born king of the Jews? And what you need to know about the story is that King Herod is king over Judea, but he is not a Jew. King Herod is an Edomite. Edom is a nation in modern-day Jordan to the, the east uh, on the other side of the Dead Sea. Herod is king over the Jews only because him and the, he, he's been working with the Romans and the Romans have given him the power to be king over Judea. And naturally, an Edomite king of the Jews is a suspicious king. He's always suspicious of his kingship and who's in charge. And if anyone is, is uh, scheming to, to push him off the throne. In fact, he becomes so suspicious as a king that he kills most of his own family and even one of his own mistresses, Mariamne. Herod knows the old Jewish prophecy that a Messiah king will be born to the Jews and restore the Jewish nation. He knows that this exists. Now obviously such a prophecy is a big problem for a king who is not Jewish. And interestingly, over a thousand years earlier, probably 13 to 1400 years earlier, there's a prophecy of this exact situation in the Bible in Numbers 24. A foreign prophet by the name of Balaam predicts that the Jewish Messiah king is going to defeat Edom. It's very curious. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will, will come out of Jacob. It's a, here's a prophecy of the star. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will, come, will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. Thirteen to fourteen hundred years earlier, we see a prophecy predicting this state of affairs. It's a remarkable thing. And so the Magi are really only the, the end of a long succession of prophecies pointing to Jesus. But of course, Herod is a clever king. He has no intention of giving up his power, and he begins to hatch his plans. The chance that this child might be from God is irrelevant to Herod. His position as king is way more important than God. And so he calls together all the Jewish religious leaders in, in the area, and he says, well, where's this king going to be born? He obviously believes that these prophecies, are, are these ancient prophecies, are, are, are true to some degree. The Jewish religious leaders, they look into the Old Testament prophecies and they find the prophet Micah. Again, Micah, he lives hundreds of years previous to the birth of Jesus. And he perfectly predicts where Jesus is going to be born. The quote in Matthew is a little bit different than Micah, but uh, it's a paraphrase of Micah 5, verse 2 and, and verse 4. It says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And here we have more proof that this king, Jesus, with his own star, is no ordinary child. You can only imagine the terror of a man like Herod. But Herod uses his wits to form a plan. He calls the Magi to himself and he says, yes, go find the son in Bethlehem. But when you find him, talk to me because I, I you know I'd like to come worship him too of course Herod has no intention of worshiping Jesus whatsoever later we learn that Herod is so bloodthirsty and cruel that he kills all of the baby boys in Bethlehem he's a truly evil man and the thing we should reflect on here is the dramatic contrast between many of the rulers of this world and the child Jesus Jesus grows up to be a child who is kind and loving. A child who comes to bless people. And the contrast between him and people like Herod and many of the other rulers of this earth could not be more potent or clear. 
Again, the Old Testament scriptures tell us about that contrast. Last week we had a sermon on Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 foretold this contrast between the violence of the rulers of this world and the fact that they ruled by their iron fist and the loving rule and kindness of Jesus. It says in uh, Isaiah 9, it says, and it's speaking of Jesus who's going to come. And he says, You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of the oppressor. And then it's Isaiah 9 says, No, but the child Jesus, what's he going to be like? Well, he's going to be a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. This child's not like other kings. There's no violence. There's no oppression in him. There's no selfish ambition. There's no uh, keeping power at all costs by killing all of your enemies. And so as we think about the baby Jesus, we ought to think about how good it is and how worthy of worship he really is just in this way. The Herod, of course, he tries to secretly co-opt the Magi. And as the Magi go about their way, they experience a tremendous miracle. The star leads them south to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is only a couple miles south of Jerusalem. And yet the star leads them south and then somehow stops them in front of the house, in front of the place where Jesus and Mary are. This is a miracle. Whatever discussions we have about the star, we can't explain this one through physical phenomena. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And what's remarkable again is how the Magi, they're overjoyed by this turn of events. They're overjoyed that the star has led them to Jesus. They're overjoyed that the star has indeed confirmed that what they know about Jesus is true. And what's remarkable here again is the contrast. Here you have Herod and you have the Jewish leadership of Jerusalem. And here they have news that potentially the Messiah King they've been waiting for for centuries has finally come. And neither Herod or the Jews are interested. They don't care. They don't go down to Bethlehem to go figure it out. They're uninterested. Yet the foreign magi are overjoyed to find Jesus. And the point is that the Jewish religious leadership, their life is good. They like living under Herod. They have no interest in a king coming to upset their lives. They think they've already got everything put together. And so we learn that the message of Jesus, the message of the Magi coming to Jesus, this is a message that's going to turn the world over. It's the message that's going to be uh, life-changing. People who understand who the child really is are going to feel a sense of joy. And if you have no interest in feeling joy at the birth of the child, that's concerning. There's the irony that the foreigners know. Like the Jews, I think sometimes religious people can become so familiar with religious things that they fail to see the miracle of what the birth of Jesus is is and what he's going to come to do God comes to walk among men it is magnificent this is something that's cosmic there's we have angels appearing to shepherds we have stars leading people it's nuts it's not human in origin yet the the account that we read is very it's it all seems to have happened Joy is the, the appropriate response. And so the Magi reach the house of Jesus and Mary. And again, we have this remarkable response. Not only are they they're overjoyed, their joy is tied to then worship. They prostrate themselves and worship. See, they bowed down and they worshiped him. If Jesus is who the Bible says he is, 
then it seems appropriate that the Magi would worship him. If Jesus is the Son of God who's come as man, if he has his own star to announce him, then it seems appropriate, doesn't it? Maybe worship is the least we can do. The Magi offer precious gifts, gold, frankincense, precious, which is like a precious incense, and myrrh, which is like a, a tree resin used for perfume and for uh, med- med- or medicinal needs and sometimes is part of embalming a, a dead body. And in fact, some have said that these gifts are appropriate for an embalming kit. I'm not sure how true that is. But indeed, we know that myrrh was later used to embalm Jesus' body when he later dies. And so these gifts already point us to what the child has come to do because this child has not come to rule as a domineering oppressive king. He's come to give his life for the sake of those who would worship him. There are few kings, if ever, that have done that, that sacrificed themselves for the sake of the people who would worship them. And so Christmas is not just about the incarnation of Jesus, it's about the incarnation of a son who's come to die, who's come to love us so powerfully that he considered his own life as as loss, as, as meaningless. And so Christmas in that way becomes glorious in a different way than we would ever imagine. In fact, some have even said that the fact that he was laid in a manger demonstrates that the, was sort of the Jews would lay a, a uh, the lamb that they were going to sacrifice at a festival in a manger, and that by laying him in a manger, it sh- shows that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb born. But the remarkable thing about Christmas is that we can have joy in the birth of Jesus, even though that he's going to come to die, because his death was not the end. He died, but then he rose from the dead to conquer death to conquer the sin that put him into death. And then he rose into heaven and now he's in heaven and he's going to come back. And so this, this increases the joy of Christmas even more because, you know, in the old days, there used to be this period of Advent before Christmas. There were these preparation weeks for Christmas. And we still do this in some ways. But in the old days, Advent was meant to be celebrated for the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus was meant to be the focus. So Christmas would come and we would think about the first coming of Jesus and it would prepare us for the second coming. And the second coming would be the joy of Christmas. And so the joy of Christmas is is not just about the birth of Jesus, but it extends to what he comes to do and his victory and his going to come again to truly manifest his rule to the fullness of its reach. And so if Jesus is doing all of that, then worship, how is worship not appropriate? Worship is the most appropriate response. How can we do other but throw ourselves at his feet and acknowledge that he is our God and he is the one to whom we owe everything. You see, and this is what Christmas really is about. And especially in this passage, Christmas is about recognizing the scale of the incarnation of Jesus and recognizing the scale of what this child, who he is and what he came to do and what he means to us. The Magi understood this, even though they knew a fraction of what we know. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm not sure that I, I'm still not sure that I'm ready to worship. I mean, I understand that the concept of worshiping is something completely foreign to the North American imagination. Americans don't, and Canadians, they don't worship anyone. We live in a democracy. But we ought to reflect on the attitude of the Magi. These were intelligent, well-traveled, powerful men. And they felt it completely appropriate to bow down to this child. 
We often, often, we also ought to reflect on the miracles these men saw, the star, the dreams that they had when they escaped from Herod at the end of the the story. This shows that the purposes of God are involved here. This is no human event. And if Jesus is God, then he is Lord just by default of that fact. Never mind that he died for you and I. Never mind that he was born as a man to live in a messy, sinful world. And he did that for you. And because he did that with us, he now knows us in a way beyond even our, our, our imagining. And so if you think about that, then worshiping the Son of God, being ready to throw yourself at his feet and give your heart and your life to him, it's not such a, a crazy concept. It's not such a leap of faith when you think about it. In fact, it's the most rational thing you can do. It makes complete sense to worship Jesus if he is who the Bible says he is. And so this is what Christmas is meant to evoke. This is why we have a Christmas service. Because it's about Jesus and it's about how much we depend on him and how he is the joy of Christmas And there's no better way to remember Christmas than to gather together and to sing about that and to hear about that. Your Savior, born to save. So let us celebrate today the birth of Jesus Christ. Amen.